All right, it appears that we are live. I will pause a second so that you all can let me know. Make sure you see me because we're doing a video about the ATF and I want to make sure everybody is able to see this and that uh, YouTube doesn't play the game. So if you are seeing this screen, this uh, live stream, please let me know by telling me where you are from and I will try to uh, pull it up on this side here to see. All right, we are here. Looks like we're here. Let me know where you're from. That'll let me know if we are live. Hopefully we have all 50 states represented here. We got Scott from Indiana. Mr. Olight from Los Gatos, California. All right, Trout, trout on dry. We got everybody here. Good, good, good. All right, I'm going to jump into this because this could be a longish, longish video. I'm going to let you know up front because uh, this morning, the ATF, well, rather the uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland has officially signed the proposed rule for the ATF engaged in the business of firearm dealing, and it affects you, and it affects me. If you, we're going to get into this, but if you not just sell one firearm, but if you offer to sell a firearm and you can make a profit, then you should be an FFL and you're in violation of this. So I'm going to uh, put this on the screen here. Let me uh, get this going here. I'm going to read you first the, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. First, I'm going to read you what uh, came out uh, this morning in the immediate. I'll show you. This is the ATF's website. It says, final rule definition of engaged in the business as a dealer in firearms. On April 10th, that's today, 2024, the, is it today? Well, today's 11. So it was actually signed yesterday. Today they did the uh, the announcement of it. The Attorney General signed ATF's final rule, uh, the definition of engaged in the business as a dealer in firearms, amending ATF's regulation in Title 27 Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, Part 478. The final rule implements the provisions of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. I want to, go again, take an opportunity to thank all of the rhinos who sold out the Constitution, John Cornyn, Mitch McConnell, and the like. Thank you for turning your back on America and violating your oath. You brought this upon us. As all of the anti-gunners are saying, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is the, the bit most prevalent, the biggest chunk of gun regulation in the last 30 years. So thanks to the rhinos for that. Uh, and then the B BSCA was effective June 25, 2022, which broadened the definition of when a person is considered engaged in the business as a dealer in firearms, other than a gunsmith or a pawnbroker. The final rule clarifies that definition. It will be published in the federal register and will be effective 30 days from the publication. So Federal Register doesn't do anything quick. It'll probably, today's Thursday, it'll probably, excuse me, I'm getting some water. It'll probably be posted sometime next week. Then it takes effect in 30 days, which affects how you sell a firearm. The final rule incorporates the Bipartisan Safer Community Act's definitions of predominantly earn a profit and terrorism and amends the regulatory definitions of engaged in the business as a dealer other than a gunsmith or pawnbroker, and principal objective of livelihood and profit to ensure each conforms with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act statutory changes and can be relied upon by the public. Yeah, we should never reply, uh, rely on the ATF. The final rule clarifies when a person is engaged in the business as a dealer in firearms at wholesale or retail by one, clarifying the definition of dealer and defining the terms purchase, sale, and something of value as they appear, as they apply to dealers. You don't have to take money for this firearm to be tripped up in this rule. Not a law, but you know what? If you violate this, they're going to throw your ass in jail and sue you and, and get, you know, monetary uh, fines against you. So it's kind of like a law in the ATF. We know don't have the power to make law yet. Here we are again. Congress sucks. And I, I also want to take a second here to say that this is not a, uh, a criminal avenue they're going after. This is a civil avenue. 
And the big part of that is that you, in a criminal trial, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. Not in a civil trial, because civil trials never try to presume guilt or innocence. They try to uh, determine whether a person violated a crime. And that is much easier to do by a preponderance of the evidence. Whereas in a criminal trial, it is proof beyond reasonable doubt. Two distinct business, uh, two distinct differences, and this is what the ATF and the DOJ is trying to do now, to go around the Constitution and to have more gun control and a universal background check uh, and universal registry. So let's continue. Number two, adding definitions for the term personal collection or personal collection of firearms or personal firearms collection and for responsible person. Number three, setting forth conduct that is presumed to constitute engaged in the business of dealing in firearms and presumed to demonstrate the intent to predominantly earn a profit from the sale or disposition of firearms, absent reliable evidence to the contrary, in civil and administrative proceedings. There you go. Civil and administrative proceedings. Much easier to jam you up uh, rather than a criminal proceeding. Number four, clarifying that the intent to predominantly earn a profit does not require the person to have received pecuniary gain, and that intent does not have to be shown when a person purchases or sells a firearm for criminal or terrorism purposes. You don't even have to be able to show it. They don't even have to prove you posted something, and they can jam you up on this. Crazy. Number five, clarifying the circumstances when a person would not be presumed to engage in the business of dealing in firearms, including as an auctioneer, or when purchasing firearms for and selling firearms from a personal collection. And that's going to be something we need to pay attention to there. Six, addressing the procedures, uh, former licensees and responsible persons acting on behalf of such licensees must follow when they liquidate business inventory upon revocation or other termination of their license. What does that mean real quick? Well, FFLs, prior to Joe Biden's uh, zero tolerance change, uh, they were, I guess they weren't bothered as much by the federal government. Now, if you make a, a clerical error, you can get shut down, have your license revoked. And then what happens? Well, when an FFL used to uh, shutter their business for whatever reason, if they had guns in their uh, in their possession that were for sale, well, they had the option of uh, they could sell those off or they could transfer them to their own personal collection by 4473ing all the guns and Bob's your uncle, that's your collection now. ETF's changing that. They're changing that. And uh, when, when a... Uh, Businesses, AT, well, FFLs go out of business. ATF now is forcing them to give them all of the copies of all of their transactions, all the 4473s. And as we already know, two years ago, GOA is proven uh, and exposed. ATF takes all of those forms, they scan them into a searchable database. And it's an illegal, unconstitutional gun registry. So for all the people who gave me shit yesterday about getting a suppressor, putting my name on a list guys we are all on the list you own one gun and you bought it in any other way than from somebody's trunk you're on a list bro you're on a list okay so let's number seven here clarifying that licensees must follow the verification and record keeping procedures in 27 cfr 47894 and subpart h rather than using the atf form 4473 when firearms are transferred that's what i just said uh Please note that this is the text of the final rule as signed by the Attorney General, but the official version of the rule will be published in the Federal Register. The rule will go into effect once it's published in the Federal Register. Actually, it goes into effect 30 days after it is published in the Federal Register. So let me uh, find my cursor. Here I want to show you this. This is the uh, Attorney General's uh, press release. We'll make this a little big real, real quick, and then we'll hit certain parts of the rule so everybody can understand. This is terrible. Make no mistake. This is terrible. This is the federal government telling you when you can sell your lawful, lawfully possessed item, you law-abiding citizen, you. How dare you follow the law? How dare you be constitutional, you suckers? Be criminals like their voting base, and they'll go easier on you. Right, Hunter? So... 
Uh, it says, the Justice Department today announced that it is submitted the, to the Federal Register the Engage in the Business Final Rule, which makes clear the circumstances in which a person is engaged in the business of dealing in firearms and thus required to obtain a federal firearms license in order to increase compliance with the federal background check requirement for firearm sales by federal firearms licensees. Under this regulation, it will, oh, before I go on, uh, criminals will still be criminals, make no mistake, none of this will stop any of your violent criminals in any of your local areas from doing anything they've been doing all along. They just won't. This only affects you and me, the people who have been lawful, who just want the government to leave us the hell alone. This doesn't, this won't affect crime because the law abiding aren't the ones doing the crime. And if they think you're doing the crime, then they'll kick your door in and murder you with a warrant at uh, 0600 in the morning and shoot you because you've been selling guns. That's what they just did last month. We went over that. So uh, under this regulation, it will not matter if guns are sold on the internet at a gun show or at a brick and mortar store. If you sell guns predominantly to earn a profit, you must be licensed and you must conduct background checks, said Merrick Garland, who's still pissed off that he's not a justice on the Supreme Court. This regulation is a historic step in the Justice Department's fight against gun violence. It will save lives. The Bipartisan Safer Communities Act enhanced background checks and closed loopholes, including by redefining when a person is engaged in the business of dealing in firearms. Today's rule clarifying application of that definition will save lives by requiring all those in the business of selling guns to get a federal license and to run background checks. Yeah, all the gun runners are really scared right now. Thus keeping guns out of the hands of violent criminals. And that's a uh, deputy AG, Lisa Monaco. Uh, I applaud the hard work of ATF in drafting this rule and reviewing the hundreds of thousands of public comments, which overwhelmingly favored the rule announced today. Because of that work, our communities will be safer. Bullshit. Um, this is from Stephen Dettelback, you know, the bumbling dope who is the director of the ATF. This is about protecting the lives of innocent, law-abiding Americans, as well as the rule of law, the one that ATF violates daily just by existing. Uh, there is a large and growing black market of guns that are being sold by people who are in the business of dealing and are going in, uh, and are doing it without a license, and therefore they are not running background checks the way the law requires. Man, criminals are still going to do this shit. <laughs> who falls for this? Like, what member? Hopefully, nobody watching. But if you fall for this, if you are watching and you think this is good, then make a comment down below, and maybe we all need to take a class, an eight-hour class from you. Um, yeah, it is fueling violence, according to uh, Dick. Uh, Dettelbach. Uh, today's final rule is about ensuring compliance with an important area of the existing law where we all know the data show and we can we can clearly see that a group of folks who openly uh, are openly flouting the law that leads to not just unfair but in this case dangerous consequences well you know stop letting criminals out with a slap on the hand that's step one uh, have judges actually hold criminals accountable and have them do the time that they've earned by violating the laws they did and hurting folks and, and injuring uh, innocent people. That's that's a huge step to dropping all the crime, all the crime. But what what do I know? I only did it for a quarter of a century. Uh, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, enacted June 25 of 22, expanded the definition of engaging in the business of uh, firearms dealing to cover all persons who devote time attention and labor to dealing in firearms as a regular course of trade or business to predominantly earn a profit, even one penny or one round of ammo or anything else through the repetitive purchase and sale of firearms. On March, March 14th of 23, President Bobo issued Executive Order 14092, which, among other things, directs the Attorney General to develop and implement a plan to clarify the de definition of who's engaged in the business of dealing in firearms and thus required to obtain a federal firearms license. The final rule conforms the ATF regulations to the new BSCA definition and further clarifies the conduct that presumptively requires a license under that revised definition, among other things. So they're saying, hey, this was passed by Congress, so leave us alone, you know, because they're going to lose everything over the uh, Chevron deference stuff. So they're trying to say the, the Chevron doesn't even apply here. Uh, the rhinos did this to you, America. Uh, 
federally licensed firearms dealers are critical to federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement in our shaded, uh, shared goal of promoting public safety. 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 Let's, let's read real here. Uh, licensees submit background checks on potential purchasers to the FBI National Institute Criminal Background Check System, which helps to keep firearms out of the hands of prohibited persons, unless your name's Hunter Biden or any of the people that the ATF ran guns uh, to, uh, thanks to Eric Holder and Barack Obama and how they're still doing it. But we'll continue. Uh, further licensees, uh, for, further, licensees keep records of sale transactions to help ensure that when a gun is used in a crime and recovered by law enforcement, it can be traced back to the first retail purchaser. That's the trace reports. They help identify and prevent straw purchasers from buying firearms on behalf of prohibited persons and criminals. And they facilitate safe storage of firearms by providing child safety locks with every transferred handgun and offer customers other secure gun storage options. Unlicensed gun, gun dealing, however, undermines these public safety features. So if criminals selling stuff on the street just give a trigger lock, I guess it's okay. I, I don't know. Uh, which is why Congress is, has long prohibited engaging in the business of dealing in firearms without required license. To increase compliance with the statutes, Congress has enacted the final rule that identifies conduct that is presumed to require a federal firearms license. And in addition to implementing the revised statute def uh, definition discussed above, the final rule clarifies the circumstances in which a license is or is not required by, among other things, adding a definition of personal firearms collection to ensure that genuine hobbyists and collectors may enhance or liquidate their collections without fear of violating the law. You got to abide by everything they say there. Otherwise, you're going to violate. It says violate the law. I thought this isn't a law. This is a rule. Hmm. Oh, they're going to say the FFL law, probably. <laughs> the final rule also provides clarity as to what licensees must do with their inventory when they go out of business. The final rule goes into effect 30 days after the date of publication in the Federal Register. And on September, 20, September 8th of 23, the Justice Department published the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and during the 90-day open comment period, ATF received nearly 388,000 comments. The final rule, as submitted to the final register, which we'll see in a second here. Uh, please note, that's the text that was signed by uh, Dingbat. Uh, so if we go to the federal, I just want to make sure this is the most recent copy because I had a earlier one. Hello. There we go. Yep, it's the same one. All right. This is it, y'all. Let's uh let's jump into it. Let me shrink this down a smidgel so you don't lose it amongst my shiny baldness. All right. The summary of the final rule. Uh I just everything I just said is the summary. It's just regurgitated. We're gonna go down to predominantly under profit. These are all things we just said two times. Uh, purchase and sale. Auctions. Fourth, who can, who license, blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. This is, let's go to the background. Y'all, yeah. sorry. Um, I had a different version of the rule, the preview, the, the before they published it, they made a couple little changes. Um, let's go to the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 86, approximately six years uh, after what they were talking about. Actually, you know what? Let's go, just go through it because somebody's going to say, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, we'll go to the background here. The Attorney General is responsible for enforcing the GCA. The responsibility in includes the authority to promulgate regulations necessary to enforce the provisions of the Gun Control Act. Congress and the Attorney General have delegated the responsibility for administering and enforcing the Gun Control Act to the Director of the, e the ATF, subject to the direction of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That's the rule of all the law of everything I just said. The GCA at 18 U.S.C. 922 Alpha 1A makes it unlawful for any person except a licensed dealer to engage in the business of dealing firearms. 
The Gun Control Act further provides that no person shall engage in the business of dealing in firearms until the person has filed an application with the ATF and revi uh, received a license to do so. Now, there's going to be somebody who says it, well, Jared, an FFL application, it's a shall issue license. Yeah, I know that. But this is something that doesn't need to be done. There's no need to do this. We, the law abiding, are not the problem. If we were, there would be no ATF because they would know we were the problem. There's enough law abiding gun owners in this country to take out small countries. Uh, we're, we're not the fucking problem. Uh, so there. Um, the required application must contain information necessary to determine eligibility for licensing. Uh, share this, please, guys, and like it. Um, we need to get this into the, into the atmosphere because YouTube has been messing with my channel. Uh, so like and share, please. Uh, for licensing and must include photograph fingerprints of the applicant and a license fee for each place the applicant is to do business. For deal, uh, fee to dealers in firearms other than destructive devices, devices is currently set by the GCA at 200 bucks for the first three year period and 90 dollars for renewal the renewal period of three years. So if you want to become an FFL, it's 200 bucks after you do your application, prints, uh, photos, the background check. 200 uh, 200 bucks for three years, 90 dollars for your renewal three until they jack up the price on that, which is coming, I'm sure. Among other items, the application of the FFL requires the applicant to include a completed Federal Bureau of Investigation form. That's the fingerprint card and a photograph for all responsible persons, including the sole proprietors. So if you have anybody who works for you, blah. Significantly under the Gun Control Act, since 1998, once licensed firearms dealers have been required to conduct background checks on prospective firearm recipients through the FBI's NICS. Okay, we know that. Um, persons who willfully engaged in dealing firearms without a license are subject to a term of imprisonment. Pay attention because this could be all of you and I if we just keep doing what we've been able to do since we've all been alive. Uh, term of imprisonment of up to five years and a fine of up to $250,000 or both. Any firearms involved or used in any such willful violation may be subject to administrative or civil seizure and forfeiture. In addition, ATF may deny license applications submitted by persons who have willfully engaged in the business of dealing in firearms without a license. So if you get jammed up in this, or if, if you say have a gun broker account and you go to uh, try to become an FFL and they can say, well, you know what? Uh, it's been 31 days since the rule was published in the register. This is your account it's still active. You are uh, willfully engaged in the business of dealing in firearms without an FFL, we're going to deny you your FFL. And now they got you because they come after you civil with this too. And remember, there is no presumption of innocence in a civil trial. Uh, term dealer under the Gun Control Act, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to read all this crazy stuff. This is old stuff. So then came the Firearms Owners Protection Act. As applies to persons selling firearms at wholesale or retail, it defined the term engaged in the business as a person who devotes time, attention, and labor to dealing in firearms as a regular course of trade or business with a principal objective of livelihood and profit through the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms. ATF has changed that. Now it's just one. And if you bought a Glock for 200 bucks years ago and you can sell it for $201, you're engaged in the business because that's a profit. Uh, if you sell it for, uh, you don't sell it for money, in exchange you take like three years worth of survival food, you're engaged in the business of selling firearms. It's uh, it's crazy, guys and gals. Uh, that's why I wanted to bring this to you. Again, like and share, please. Like and share. Um, boom, 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 boom. I don't want to go over the legislative history of the FOPA because it's all changing here. With respect to personal collections... Firearms Owner Protection Act included a provision codified at 18 U.S.C. 923C that expressly authorized licensees to maintain and dispose of private firearms collections separately from their business operations. However, under FOPA, as amended, the personal collection provision was and remains subject to three limitations. First, if a licensee records a disposition, i.e. transfer of any firearm from their inventory, business inventory to a personal collection, that firearm legally remains part of the licensee's business inventory until one year has elapsed after the transfer date. Should the licensee wish to sell or otherwise dispose of any such personal firearm during that one year period, the licensee must retransfer the applicable firearm back to the business inventory. 
the subsequent transfer from the business inventory would then be subject to the record keeping and background check requirements of the GCA applicable to all other firearms in the business inventory. So if you're an FFL right now and you're thinking, shit, before this goes into effect, I'm just going to transfer all my guns to myself and I can sell them that way too. Because I have 30 days. Well, you have what has to be in your inventory for one year, your personal inventory before you, uh, it no longer jams you up under your license. Second, if a license acquires a firearm for or disposes of a firearm from a personal collection for the purpose of willfully evading the restrictions placed upon licensees under the Gun Control Act, that firearm is deemed part of the business inventory. Thus, as explained in FOPA's legislative history, uh, circuitous transfers are not exempt from otherwise applicable licensee requirements. Third, even when a licensee has made a bona fide transfer of a firearm from their personal collection, Section 923C requires a licensee to record the disposition of the firearm in a bound volume along with the name, place, and residence and date of birth of the individual transferee. Or, if a corporation or a business entity, then the transferee's identity and principal and or local places of business. Blah, 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 blah. So you have to, like, they just want to know, it's a registry. Who has it? Where is it going? Why did you sell it? Where, who, you know, what color hair do they have? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, talks about Obama's uh, stuff. Uh, 2016, Obama announced several executive actions to reduce gun violence. Didn't work. You know why? Because criminals don't follow this crap. Uh, and uh, to make communities across the U.S. safer, except all the Democrat-controlled cities are getting worse. Um Change principles relating to licensees consistent with relevant court filings. These are different incidents under Obama. This this whole rule is just long and tedious. All right. This is the notice of proposed rulemaking, which we know because we're here now. And do 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 further stated that since 1968, that's the notice of proposed rulemaking. Oh, here we go. I wanted to see this. All right. Therefore, in light of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act changes to the Gun Control Act and to provide additional guidance on what it means to be engaged in the business as a dealer, Within the diverse modern marketplace for firearms, the notice of proposed rulemaking proposed to amend the regulatory definition of dealer in 27 CFR 478.11 to clarify that firearms dealing may occur whenever or through whatever medium qualifying activities are conducted. This includes at any domestic or international public or private marketplace or premises. The proposed definition would provide non-exclusive examples of such existing marketplaces, a gun show or event, a flea market, an auction house or a gun range or a club, at one's home, by mail order or over the internet, through the use of other electronic means, example, an online broker, online auction, text messaging service, social media raffle or website. Raffle, how many of our gun groups hold raffles of firearms in order to raise revenue so that they can sue the government. Well, under this, they're going to need to become FFLs to do that. Uh, or at any other domestic or international public or private marketplace or premises. Many of these examples were referenced by courts even before the BSCA expansion, as well as in the ATF regulatory materials and common publicly available uh, sources. These examples in the NPRM were designed to clarify that firearms dealing requires a license in whatever place or through, through whatever medium the firearms are purchased and sold, including the internet and locations other than a traditional brick and mortar store. However, regardless of the modern, uh, regardless of the medium through or location in which the dealer buys and sells firearms to obtain a license under the GCA, the dealer must still have a fixed premises in a state from which to conduct business subject to the license and comply with all applicable state and local laws regarding the conduct of such business. What they're saying is some people were selling guns uh, through all these online places and tech services, blah, 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 blah. And they don't have a brick and mortar store. Therefore, they're in violation of this too. Um, 
Notice of proposed rulemaking explain that even though an applicant must have a business premises in a particular state to obtain a license under the GCA, firearms purchases or sales requiring a license in the United States may involve conduct outside of the United States. Specifically, 18 U.S.C. 922A1A has, a law, has long prohibited any person without a license from shipping, transporting, or receiving any firearm in foreign commerce while in the course of being engaged in the business of dealing firearms. Unless, of course, you are the AFT, you can just run guns to criminals and those guns can kill Border Patrol agents. Eh, and nothing happens because, you know, eh, business. Uh, the notice proposed rulemaking further note of that as recently amended by the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. The Gun Control Act now expressly prohibits a person from smuggling, you could never smuggle guns before, or knowingly taking a firearm out of the United States with the intent to engage in conduct that would constitute a felony for which a person may be prosecuted in a court in the United States if the conduct had occurred within the United States. So if you smuggle a gun out of the U.S., to sell it, and you would have needed a license to do it in the U.S., you just violated U.S. law, even though you're not in the U.S., and the U.S. can prosecute you, even though U.S. law doesn't apply to wherever you are. That's what that just said. <laughs> uh, willfully engaging in the business of dealing in firearms without a license is an offense punishable by more than one year in prison and constitutes a felony. Therefore, unlicensed persons who purchase firearms in the United States and smuggle them or take them out of the United States or conspire to attempt to do so for resale in another country are now engaging in the conduct that is unlawful under the Gun Control Act. You're not, not in this country that the Gun Control Act has any power in, but this is the, the federal government. Like and share. If you think the government sucks, like this video and share it, please. <laughs> Uh, the definition is what I, we need to understand this because this is what's the big part of this change is right here. The definition of engage in the business, purchase and sale. To further clarify the regulatory definition of dealer engage in the business with the predominant intent of earning a profit through the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms in 27 CFR 47811, the NPRM also proposed to define based on common dictionary definitions and relevant case law, the terms purchase and sale and derivative, uh, derived terms thereof, such as purchases, purchasing, purchased, and sells, selling, or sold. Specifically, the rule proposed to define purchase and derivative terms thereof as, quote, the act of obtaining a firearm in exchange for something of value, and the term sale and derivative terms thereof, including resale, as the act of providing a firearm in exchange for something of value. That doesn't say cash. It could be Bitcoin, it could be bubble gum, it could be uh, a custom knife made by Jason Knight. It could be anything of value. Rice is of value. So uh, food it can jam you up. The term something of value was proposed to include money, credit, personal property, example, another firearm or ammunition, a service, a controlled substance, drugs. So you can't, can't train your gun for drugs hunter, or any other medium of exchange or valuable consideration. So anything that they can say has a value. Defining those terms, uh, these terms to include any method of payment for a firearm would clarify that persons cannot avoid the licensing requirement by, for instance, bartering or providing or receiving services in exchange for firearms with the predominant intent to earn pecuniary gain when uh, even where when no money is exchanged so if say you live in the northeast and, and it snows a lot and your plow broke I'm like hey dude um i need you to plow me and my mom out all winter because i can't do it and shoveling is is a bitch i will give you this glock 43x if you would shovel for a uh, plow for us for the year nope you just violated that because that plow service has a value. So these are the things the ATF is trying to jam people up. Um, crazy. The definition of engage in the business as applies to auctioneers. Um, it doesn't. Uh, basically, it, it, it doesn't. So auctioneers can still run their stuff 
Uh, we'll run it because it might be an auction you're watching. Because the definitions of purchase and sale broadly include services providing uh, provided in exchange for firearms, both as defined by common dictionaries and as proposed in the, uh, Nash, the NPRM, the department further proposed to make clear that certain persons who provide auctioneer services are not required to be licensed as dealers. Okay, that's good. There you go. You don't need to keep going on that. D, presumptions that a person is engaged in the business. Pay attention. The notice of proposed rulemaking pointed out that the department has observed through its enforcement efforts, regulatory functions, knowledge of existing case law, and subject matter expertise, remember they can't field strip a damn Glock, that persons who are engaged in certain firearms purchase and sale activities are more likely than not to be engaged in the business of dealing in firearms at wholesale or resale or retail. These activities have been observed through a variety of criminal, civil, and administrative enforcement actions and proceedings brought by the department, including one, ATF inspections of prospective and existing wholesale and retail dealers of firearms who are or intend to be engaged in the business, two, criminal investigations and the resulting prosecutions, i.e. cases of persons who engage in the business of dealing in firearms without a license. Uh, boom, 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 boom. President Nixon, I just saw this because a good, good question here. Thank you. Uh, first off, thank you for the uh, the super chat. Appreciate you. Can you use, use gun brokers still? Then, if you're not making a profit selling a firearm, for example, bought a firearm for nine hundred and sold it for eight fifty, need to pay bills. Well, I guess we're going to need to keep reading to find out, my friend, because the ATF, if not vague, then they are nothing. Uh, so we're going to find out by going through this. Uh, three, uh, civil and administrative actions under 18 U.S.C. 924-D to seize and forfeit firearms intended to be sold by persons engaged in the business without a license. Four, ATF cease and desist letters issued to prevent Section 922-A1A violations. And five, ATF administrative proceedings under 18 U.S.C. 923 to deny licenses to persons who willfully engage in the business of dealing in firearms without a license or to revoke or deny renewal of existing licenses held by licensees who aided and abetted that misconduct. In addition, numerous courts have identified certain activities or factors that are relevant to determining whether a person is engaged in the business. The rule, therefore, Propose, uh, propose to establish uh, rebutable, rebutable, rebuttable presumptions in certain contexts to help unlicensed persons, industry operations personnel, and others determine when a person is likely engaged in the business requiring a dealer's license. And this should help answer our question or part of it. Um, I'm going to say this too because I forgot to say this in the beginning. If you think the ATF should be sued out of orbit on this, I do then help those groups who are going to be the ones who do it. I just happen to be wearing a Firearms Policy Coalition shirt today. Um, they might be one who you might want to uh, help. GOA might be one you want to help. Second Amendment Foundation might be one you want to help. You insert the name, you insert the group, go support them. For the, the three I mentioned in the links, of, uh, in the description rather of every video I make, there are direct links to help them directly. I get nothing out of that link. All the money goes to them. You just get a little bit of a discount. You can also buy blackout coffee roasts for Second Amendment Foundation, Gun Owners of America, and Firearms Policy Coalition. And we give $2 for each one of those items sold right back to them every single month to help them sue the ATF. So support those who support you guys and gals. These groups are going to need some help. Uh, the, the, the department considered but did not uh, propose in the rulemaking uh, an alternative that would have set a medium, uh, a minimum numerical threshold of fire. So they wanted, they were thinking about, they were considering, all right, it, say five. If you sell five, five or under in a year, you don't need to get an FFL. If you sell over five, you do. But they didn't put that in because that approach was not proposed for several reasons. First, while selling large numbers of firearms or engaging or offering to engage in frequent transactions may be highly indicative of business activity. Neither the courts nor the department have recognized a set minimum number of firearms purchased or resold that triggers the licensing requirements. Similarly, 
There is no minimum number of transactions that determines whether a person is engaged in the business of dealing firearms. If there's no minimum, what does that mean? One. You can get jammed up for one. Even a single firearm transaction. I'm going to highlight that so you can see that. Even a single firearm transaction or an offer to engage in a transaction, meaning you don't even have to sell the gun, you just offer a single offer to engage in a transaction. When combined with other evidence, ATF being vague again, may be sufficient to require a license. For example, even under the previous statutory definition, courts have upheld convictions for dealing without a license when few firearms, if any, were actually sold, when other factors were also present, such as the person representing to others a willingness and an ability to repetitively purchase firearms for resale. That's straw purchasing. So we're all going to pay for that, right? On the other hand, courts have stated that an isolated firearm transaction would not require a license when other factors were not present. Second, in addition to the tracing concerns expressed by ATF in response to comments on the 1979 ANPRM, a person could st uh, structure their transactions to avoid a minimum threshold by spreading out their sales over time. Finally, the department does not believe there is currently a sufficient evidentiary basis without consideration of additional factors to support a specific minimum number of firearms bought or sold for a person to be considered engaged in the business. So back to the question, if I sell a $900 gun for a $50 loss, am I engaged in the business? Well, how many other guns did you sell that year? Is it the only one? Have you posted a number of guns for sale and that's the only one that sold? but you posted more. These are all the things the ATF say that they will jam you up on. So there is no straight answer. If I sell a gun for, uh, for eight fifty and I bought it for nine, am I, am I jammed up? They're going to look at all this stuff. The ATF is going to look at how they can jam you up rather than how they can vindicate you, right? The ATF only exists to restrict a constitutionally protected right that cannot be infringed. <laughs> That's the only reason they're there. They're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So rather than establish, again, like and subscribe if you think ATF sucks, hit the thumbs up right there. Doesn't cost you anything. Share it. Subscribe to the channel. Costs you nothing, but it lets the algorithm know that ATF sucks. So if you could do that right now, I'd appreciate that. Rather than establishing a minimum threshold number of firearms purchased or sold, excuse me, the proposed rulemaking notice proposed to clarify that absent Reliable evidence to the contrary, a person would be presumed to be engaged in the business of dealing firearms when the person, one, sells or offers uh, for sale firearms and also represents to potential buyers or otherwise demonstrates a willingness and an ability to purchase and sell additional firearms, two, spends more money or its equivalent on purchases of firearms for the purpose of resale than the person's reported taxable gross income during the applicable period of time. Do you understand how dangerous that is? I'm going to read that again to you. I want you to think. Spends more money or its equivalent on purchases of firearms for the purpose of resale than the person's reported taxable gross income during the applicable period of time. Now they're going to be looking at your taxes to see how much you make Versus how much, how many guns you bought and how much you spent on guns. Man, there's so much I could say right now, but I know the ATF's watching. So we'll continue. Number three, re repetitively purchase for the purpose of resale or sells or offers for sale firearms, A, through straw or sham businesses or individual straw purchasers or sellers, or B, that cannot lawfully be purchased or possessed, including one, stolen firearms, two, firearms with the licensee's serial number removed, uh, obliterated or altered, three, firearms imported in violation of law, sorry, um, or four, machine guns or other weapons defined as firearms under 26 U.S.C. 
5845 Alpha that were not properly registered under the NFA and transfer record. And... Sorry, man. Uh, there's a lot going on. This is some other stuff that we're watching. Uh, four, repetitively sells or offers for sale firearms, A, within 30 days after they were purchased. So if you take a gun to the range, you just bought it, and you realize, you know what, this gun doesn't really fit my hand well or uh, is too small or too big for me. Um, you know what, I don't like the kick of this 45 or this 10 uh, or uh, whatever. I don't like the grip angle of this gun. I'm just going to sell it. You better wait for 31 days because – it's your lawfully procured items. You, you should be able to do whatever you want, but they're telling you, nah, you can't do that. B, that are new or like new in their original packaging. So if you sell a gun that's like new in its original packaging, you could get jammed up here. Or C, that are some of the similar kind, i.e. make, manufacturer, model, caliber, gauge, and action, and type, i.e. classification of a firearm as a rifle, shotgun, revolver, pistol, frame, receiver, machine gun, silencer, destructive device, or other firearm. Five, as a former licensee or responsible person acting on behalf of the former licensee, meaning you don't have your license anymore, but you're still acting to sell those guns, sells or offers for sale firearms that were in the business inventory as such licensee at the time the licensee was terminated, i.e. license revocation, denial of license renewal, license expiration, or surrender of license, and were not transferred to a personal collection in accordance with 18 U.S.C. 923C and the CFR. Or six, as a former licensee or responsible person acting on behalf of a former licensee, sells or offers for sale firearms that were transferred to a personal collection of such former licensee or responsible person prior to the time the license was terminated, unless A, Firearms were received and transferred without any intent to willfully evade the restrictions placed on the licensees by Chapter 44, Title 18 of USC, and B, not or B, and B, one year has passed from the day of the transfer of the personal collection. There's a lot to this rule, guys. They are trying to trip up everybody if you sell a gun and you're not an FFL. They are trying to trip you up no matter what. So, again, if you think the ATF sucks, hit that like button, share the video, Subscribe down below. Tell your friends about this live stream. The proposed rule provided that any one circumstance or a combination of the circumstances set forth above would give rise to the rebuttable presumption that a person is engaged in the business of dealing in firearms and would need to be licensed under the Gun Control Act. The Gun Foodie. What's up, buddy? Uh, this is a dangerous precedent that they're trying to set with the impact of lawful businesses across the industry. You know, someone... Remove Karen from the wheel. Yeah, this is bad. This this is very, very, very bad. Uh, boom. Uh, the activities set forth in the proposed rebuttal sub, uh, show that it considered blah, 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 blah. Okay, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, the department recognized that the notice proposed rulemaking that certain transactions were not likely to be sufficient to support a presumption that a person is engaged in the business of dealing firearms. So these are the areas that they don't presume that you're engaged in the business. So we're going to want to pay attention to this. For this reason, the proposed rule also included examples of when a person would not be presumed to be engaged in the business of dealing in firearms. Specifically, under the proposed rule, a person would not be presumed to be engaged in the business when the person transfers firearms only as bona fide gifts or occasionally sells firearms only to obtain more valuable, valuable, desirable, or useful firearms for their personal collection or hobby, unless their conduct also demonstrates a predominant intent to earn a profit. I'm going to say that again, because this is what we need to focus on if we are going to sell our guns lawfully, according to the ATF now. You have to transfer them as a bona fide gift, so if you're going to give one to your son or daughter, bona fide gift, or two, occasionally sell a firearm only to obtain a more valuable, desirable, or useful firearm for your personal collection or hobby. Unless it's to predominantly earn uh, your intents to earn a profit. So how is that going to happen? So think of this. Uh, I'm selling my gun because I want a more expensive gun. But then somewhere down the line, I don't like that gun. I sell that gun. Well, 
Well, that is a profit under this. So there's a lot, a lot of gray area, man, here. A lot of gray area. To, they're just trying to just kill America, basically. The notice of proposed rulemaking noted that the rebuttable presumptions are supported by the department's investigative, regulatory, and enforcement experience. Who cares? As well as conduct that the courts have found to require a license even before the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act expanded the definition of engage in the business. Uh, Emacs Tactical says, as someone who vendors at gun shows up and down the East Coast, there are already plenty of plainclothes ATF at them and you learn to pick them out quickly. Yeah, there are. ATF presence will greatly increase at them now to jam up. Yes, 100%. Very good point. Uh, they would rather jam up you than to go get criminals uh, at the border or whatever. Uh, moreover, these proposed presumptions are consistent with the case-by-case -case analytical framework long applied by the courts in determining whether a person has violated 18 U.S.C. 922A1A and 923A by engaging in the business of dealing in firearms without a license. The department observed that the notice proposed rulemaking that the fundamental purposes of the Gun Control Act would be severely undermined if persons were allowed to repetitively purchase and resell firearms to predominantly earn a profit without conducting background checks, keeping records, and otherwise complying with the license requirements of the Gun Control Act. The department therefore proposed criteria for when a person is presumed to be engaged in the business to strike an appropriate balance that captures persons who would be licensed under the Gun Control Act as amended without limiting or regulating activity that is truly a hobby or an enhancement of a personal collection. The first uh, proposed presumption that a person would be presumed to be engaged in the bus uh, business when a person sells or offers for sale firearms and also represents to potential buyers or otherwise demonstrates a willingness an ability to purchase and sell additional firearms reflects that the definition of engaged in the business in 18 USC 921-821-C does not require that a firearm actually be sold by a person so long as the person is holding themselves out as a dealer. This is because the relevant definition of engaged in the business defines the phrase by reference to the intent to predominantly earn a profit through the repetitive purchase and resale of firearms, even if those firearms are not actually repetitively purchased or resold. <laughs> the second presumption proposed that a person is engaged in the business when spending more money or its equivalent on purchases of firearms for the purpose of resale than the person's reported taxable gross income during the applicable period of time reflects that Persons who spend more money or its equivalent on purchases of firearms for resale than their reported gross income are likely to be primarily engaged in their income from those sales, which is even stronger evidence of an intent to profit than merely supplementing one's income. Alternatively, such persons may be using funds derived from criminal activities to purchase firearms, for example, including funds provided by a co-conspirator to uh, repetitively purchase and resell firearms without a license or for other criminal purposes or funds that were laundered from past illicit firearms transactions. <laughs> that sounds like Operation Fast and Furious. <laughs> uh, such illicit and repetitive firearm purchase and sale activities do not require proof of profit for the government to prove the requisite intent under 18 U.S.C. 921A22, which states that proof of profit is not required as to a person who engages in irregular and repetitive purchase and disposition of firearms for criminal purposes or terrorism. You don't have to make a profit. You don't even have to offer them for sale uh, or, or make them for sale. You just have to have an offer for sale. Uh, if you buy more or spend more money on guns than you actually earn, you're jammed up on this. If a friend is doing it for you, you're jammed up on this. Uh, it's just, there, there's so many ways that they are looking to just take away the Second Amendment. I'd have more respect for the ATF if they had the balls to say, we're going to try to repeal the Second Amendment. 
And then let's just get it on. Let's just do it. Like instead of chipping away and being like a little bitch, Steve Dettelback, uh, like just do it, like be a man about it. And, and let's just see if you're more powerful than the country, I guess. Mad Mechanic, thank you very much. One, ATF, since you're watching, I would like my Form 1 processed too. It, it, uh, is it just me or is the ATF against the citizens of this great country? Yes, they, they are as a as, a, as an organization, they exist to restrict a, a constitutionally protected right. All right. The, the first presumption proposed within the third category listed above that a person would be presumed to engage in the business when repetitively purchasing, reselling, or offering to sell firearms through straw or sham businesses or individual straw purchasers or sellers reflects that persons who conceal their transactions by setting up straw or sham businesses or hiring middlemen to conduct transactions on their behalf are often engaged in the business of dealing in firearms without a license. The second presumption proposed under the third category that a person would be presumed to be engaged in the business when repetitively purchasing, reselling, or offering for sale firearms that cannot lawfully be possessed reflects that such firearms are actively sought by criminals and earn higher profits from their illicit dealer. The dealer is therefore taking on additional labor and risk with the intent of increasing profits. Such dealers will often buy and sell stolen firearms and firearms with obliterated serial numbers because such firearms are preferred by both sellers and buyers to avoid background checks and crime gun tracing. They'll, they sometimes sell unregistered National Firearm Act weapons and unlawful imported firearms because those firearms are more difficult to obtain, cannot be traced through the uh, National Firearms Registry and Transfer Record, uh, and they may sell for substantial profit. Although these presumptions addressing repetitive straw purchase transactions and contraband firearm sales are intended to establish when persons are most likely to have a requisite intent to predominantly earn a profit, such cases are also supported by 18 U.S.C. Uh, A22, which does not require government to prove an intent to profit where a person repetitively uh, purchases and disposes of firearms for criminal purposes. So even if you're just <laughs> doing it and people are using those guns in crimes, you can get jammed up that way too. Or they'll knock your uh, door in at 6 a.m., uh, if you work at the Clinton airport and, uh, and, and eliminate you. These presumptions are also implicitly uh, supported by 18 U.S.C. 923C, which deems any firearm acquired or disposed of uh, with purpose uh, of willfully evading restrictions placed on licensed dealers under the Gun Control Act to be business inventory, not part of personal collection. Uh, what's this? Nate. Hey, Nate. What's going on, buddy? They basically want already financially struggling, law-abiding Americans to struggle more to exercise our unalienable rights, which is beyond stupid. Beyond stupid, indeed. That is the definition of uh, federal bureaucracy is, is that. They, they just suck. They don't want you. <laughs> they don't need you. They just operate to give themselves more power. The first presumption proposed under the fourth category listed above repetitive sales or offers for sale of firearms within 30 days of purchase reflects that firearms for personal collection are not likely to be repetitively sold within such short period of time from purchase. I'm going to call bullshit. Uh, that is when someone realizes that this gun sucks and I don't want it in my collection. They buy it, take it to the range. And for whatever reasons like I gave many before, they don't want it. It's their gun. They bought it lawfully. They can sell it lawfully, but not anymore. At 30 days after this is printed in the registry. Likewise, under the second and the third presumptions proposed under this category, the fourth category, the de department has observed through its investigative and regulatory experience that persons who repetitively sell firearms in new condition or in like new condition in their original packaging or firearms for the same or similar kind and type are not as likely to be repetitively selling such firearms for personal collection. If I, what does that mean? If you sell 13 Glock 19s, 
that's not your personal collection that you're buying them for resale because they're uh, desirable item is what they're saying. In contrast with sales from a personal collection, persons engaged in the business who are selling from a business inventory can earn the greatest profit by selling firearms in the best in a new condition or by selling in particular makes and models of firearms that their customers want most. The presumption under the fifth category listed above that a former licensee a responsible person acting on behalf of such former licensee is engaged in the business when they sell or offer for sale firearms that were in the business inventory upon license termination. It recognizes that the licensee likely intended to predominantly earn a profit from the repetitive purchase and resale of those firearms, not to acquire firearms as a personal collection or otherwise as a personal firearm. So if you are an FFL and you're going out of business for whatever reason, you transfer those to your personal collection because those guns were originally purchased with the ideal of re resale and earning a profit, you're tripped up under this, even though you transferred them to yourself. The final presumption proposed that a former licensee or responsible person acting on behalf of the former licensee is engaged in the business when they sell or offer for sale firearms that were transferred to the personal inventory of such former licensee or responsible person prior to the time the licensee license was terminated unless the firearms were received or transferred without any intent or willful to willfully evade the restrictions placed on the licensees by chapter 44 of title 18 and one year has passed since the transfer is consistent with 18 USC 923 C of the GCA, which deems firearms transferred from the licensees business inventory to their personal collection or otherwise as a personal firearm as business inventory until one year after the transfer. This provision indicates a congressional determination that one year is sufficient is a sufficient period for a former licensee to wait before a firearm that is purchased for personal use can be considered part of a personal collection or otherwise as a personal firearm, uh, as opposed to business inventory being resold for profit. So if you transfer, if you're an FFL or former FFL, transfer your stuff to your personal collection. You can't sell them for one year as a personal item. If you do it before a year, it is still your business inventory and it was designed to be resold as a profit. Uh, in, the no in the notice of proposed rulemaking, the department noted that these presumptions may be rebuted in an administrative or civil proceeding with reliable evidence dem demonstrating that a person is not engaged in the business of dealing firearms, meaning you have to prove that you're not doing it rather than us having to prove you are doing it. If, for example, there is reliable evidence that an individual purchased a few collectible firearms from a licensed dealer where all sales are final then and then resold those firearms back to the licensee within 30 days because the purchaser was not satisfied. The presumption that the unlicensed reseller is engaged in the business arising from the evidence of repetitive sales or offers for sale of firearms within 30 days of purchase may, rebu may be rebuted or rebutted. Similarly, the presumption that the person who repetitively resells firearms of the same make and model within one year of the purchase is engaged in the business could be rebutted based on evidence that the person is a collector who occasionally sells one specific kind and type of curio or relic firearm to buy another uh, that is in better condition, i.e. to trade up or enhance the seller's personal collection. Another example in which evidence may rebut the presumption would be the occasional sale, loan, or trade of an almost new firearm in its original packaging to a family member for lawful purposes, such as their use in hunting, without the intent to earn a profit or to circumvent the requirements placed on licensees. Yes, so much of this. Like this video and share it, please. It's an hour old already. I apologize. But in order to know what's in it, guys and gals, unlike Nancy Pelosi says, in order to know what's in it, you actually have to read it. We don't just pass it and then guess. We actually have to read it. Because uh, I don't think we should be held uh, responsible for gray areas unless we know what they are. Actually, we shouldn't be held responsible for any of this bullshit. All right. Let's see. Where are we at? The notice of proposed rulemaking. All right, NPRM explained that the statutory definition of engaged in the business excludes a person who makes occasional sales, exchanges, or purchases of firearms for the enhancement of a personal collection or for a hobby or who sells all 
or part of his collection of firearms. To clarify this uh, definitional exclusion of the proposed, uh, the proposed rule would, one, add a single definition for the terms personal collection, personal collection of firearms, and personal firearms collection. Number two, explain how those terms apply to licensees. And three, make clear that licensees must follow the verification and record keeping procedures in 27 CFR 978, 94, and subpart H, rather than using an ATF form 4473 when they acquire firearms from other licensees, including a sole proprietor who transfers a firearm to their personal collection or otherwise as a personal firearm in accordance with that CFR. Specifically, the notice of proposed rulemaking proposed to define personal collection, personal collection of firearms, and personal firearms collection as personal firearms that a person accumulates for study, comparison, exhibition, or for hobby. Example, non-commercial recreational activities for personal enjoyment, such as hunting or skeet, target or competitive shooting. Hmm, no self-defense, huh? This reflects a common definition of the terms collection and hobby. Uh, my collection is all for personal self-defense and self-defense of family and community. The phrase for a hobby was adopted from 18 U.S.C. 921, which excludes from the definition of engaged in the business firearms acquired for a hobby. The NPRM also ex expressly excluded from the definition of personal collection any firearms purchased for resale or made with the predominant intent to earn a profit. It further explained that under the Gun Control Act and its implementing regulations, a licensee who requires firearms for a personal collection is subject to certain additional requirements before the firearms can become part of his personal collection. Accordingly, the proposed rule further explained how the term would apply to firearms acquired by a licensee. Uh, example, a person engaged in the business as a licensed manufacturer, importer, or dealer under the Gun Control Act by defining personal collection, personal collection of firearms, and personal firearms collection when applied to licensees to include only firearms that were, one, acquired or transferred without the intent to willfully evade and restrictions placed on licensees to recorded by the licensee and acquisition in the licensee uh, as an acquisition in the acquisition and disposal record with accordance to the CFRs three recorded as a disposition. In other words, FFLs, if you get in stuff like this, you got to record it and put it in your bound book. F another section, the definition of responsible person. Oh, this sucks. <laughs> So uh, what's a responsible person? It excludes, for example, the last couple of lines here, uh, store clerks or cashiers who cannot make management uh, or policy decisions without, with respect to firearms. So if somebody makes a decision that with respect to the firearms, they're going to be jammed up under this as, as well. What does it mean for a predom to predominantly earn a profit? Well, let's see. There's another change in the definitions here. NPRM also explained that the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act brought in the definition of engaging the business as a dealer by submitting to predominantly, uh, by substituting to predominantly earn a profit for with the pr principal objective of livelihood or profit. It also defined the term to predominantly earn a profit. Okay. The NPRM proposed to further implement the BSCA's amendments by one, clarifying that the proof of profit proviso, i.e., the BSCA's provision that the proof of profit shall not be required as to a person who engages in the regular and repetitive purchase and disposition of firearms for criminal purposes or terrorism. So if you're doing it to be a criminal, then you don't have to turn a profit. Also excludes intent to profit, thus making clear that it is not necessary for the federal government to prove that a person intended to make a profit if they're dealing in firearms for criminal purposes or terrorism. Two, clarifying that the person may have a pre uh, predominant intent to profit even if that person does not actually obtain pecuniary gain from selling the firearms. So I take a $900 gun. I only sell it for $850. Am I okay? According to that, no. Because you may, may not have uh, intended to profit, but you sold the gun. Hmm. Number three, establishing 
a presumption in civil and administrative proceedings that certain conduct demonstrates the requisite intent to predominantly earn a profit, absent reliable evidence to the contrary. Again, civil, so that you are not innocent until proven guilty. Civil, it's you're going to get jammed up, and we're going to, if we have this, then this automatically demonstrates the requisite intent. So you're behind the eight ball. These proposed regulatory amendments are consistent with the plain language of the Gun Control Act. Neither the pre bipartisan Safer Communities Act definition of with the principal objective of livelihood and profit or the post BSCA definition of to predominantly earn a profit requires the government to prove that it did the defendant actually profited from firearms transactions. So you don't have to be out, you know, they don't even have to prove that you profited from it and you can still get jammed up. Uh, I hate the ATF. If you hate the ATF again, like the video and share. Businesses, fire other justifies rebuttal presumptions. It's all stuff that we pretty much said already. H, the disposition of business inventory after termination of licensee. We already know that. Um, they're not going to let you try to play their wiggle, wiggle game, is what they're basically saying. Um, and when you go out of business, they get all of your 4473s. 30-day period from license termination uh, for a former licensee to transfer the firearms either to another licensee or to a person, uh, personal collection parallels the period of time for record, record disposition after license termination of the Gun Control Act and is re a reasonable period for that person to wind down operations after discontinuance of business without acquiring new firearms. Uh, that period of liquidation was proposed to, ex to be extendable by the director for good cause, such as to allow pawn redemptions if required by state, local, or tribal law. So they give you 30 days to wind down and liquidate. Uh, I, the transfer of firearms between FFLs and 4473s. I'm going to skip some of this stuff now. I'm sick of reading. Analysis of comments and the department's responses. So they're getting into comments and um, let's let's see a little bit of their their bullshit here. <laughs> In response to the national uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking, ATF received nearly three hundred eighty eight thousand comments. Of these, there were nearly two hundred fifty eight thousand comments that expressed support for the proposed rule, or approximately two thirds of the number of comments. You know. <sighs> This is the part that angers angers me so much. Because just like so many people, when we did the videos, when they dropped the notice of proposed rulemaking, when I did the video and I was like, hey, guys, please go make a comment. It'll take fucking five minutes of your life. And so many people were like, no, not going to do it. They're telling you, the reason that they're doing this is they're saying, well, two-thirds of the people who have commented said they want this. So we're doing it. The last time we actually got involved, made a bunch of comments that stopped a rule, we actually did stop one. It was the, the attempted green tip ammo ban under Barack Obama. People got pissed. They made comments. We overwhelmingly told them to get fucked, and it was stopped. They pulled it. But so many people now just don't want to get involved. They've given up whatever, and now they're just going to keep continuing to infringe so I'm, I'm glad I actually stopped to read this because this, this proves to you how they're operating. So when we say, hey, guys, you know, take 30 seconds to make a comment and don't copy a comment that's been submitted 155,000 times, like the ones that uh, are, are pre-generated for you. Why? Because that's easy for us to just type a name and hit send because we're lazy as Americans. Like type your own, make your own. Here's proof. Two thirds of the people of these over 252,000 or approximately 98% were submitted by individuals as form letters, i.e. the identical text that is often supplied by organizations or found online and recommended to be submitted by the agency as a comment. So 98% of the comments of the two-thirds that were in favor of were the exact comment. So those are the ones by Moms Demand Action, Giffords, and Brady, and, and Bloomberg, and March for Our Lives. That's that's their stuff right there. Just They just said it. 
there were nearly 99,000 comments opposed to the rule or approximately 26% of the total number of comments. So 99,000 people got involved and said, hey, ATF, piss off. We don't want this. But it was only 26% of the people who actually did it. Uh, of which over 80,000 or approximately 81% of them were form letters. So of the of the 99,000 people who, who got involved, 19,000 people could actually write a, a comment theirself is what they're saying. The rest of them took the easy way, the, the lazy way out and did a form letter. The commenters grounds for support and opposition along with the specific concerns and suggestions that discussed the below. I'm not, I'm not getting into the comments. Um, if you really want to read all those, you can. Our health. Thank you. First off, thank you very much for the uh, support. I made a comment, but in the next 60 minutes, the comments number went, uh, went down by 34,000. They were cheating. Of course. Yeah, of course. It's, 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 I'm sure it's not on the up and up, man. Anything the government does is not on the up and up. Um, but yes, thank you for making a comment. Hopefully it was uh, an original. Uh, let me see. What I'm going to do is take this off so when I scroll, you guys don't go blind. Okay. Uh, see if anything's underneath the comment section here. Went down. Yeah, we got you. Thank you. Uh, comments, comments, comments. Comments, response. Uh, this is a huge document, so let me see. Comments, still comments. I'm down to page 279. Comments, comments. Yeah, they're tearing into the different comments received, and, and then they respond. Um, Let's see. All right, so this part, maybe people want to see this. Uh, let's blow it up a little. This is how they're going to say, well, if you say it's, it's too much money or it takes too much of your time to follow this new rule we just jammed up your ass, <laughs> then uh, then here here's their pushback. They're saying, well... A Form 4, which is the application to become an FFL, only costs 200 bucks. You know, that's it. A fingerprint card, they're free. So, yeah, you could do that. Or if you go to some place, you know, that would charge you, you know, it could be 24 bucks. It's various sources. Uh, the average cost is about 12 bucks. Uh, postage, mailing, and shipping from uh, the USPS to send that card in to us, uh, it's a buck. Uh, to have your photograph taken is about 17 bucks at CVS and, and passport photo places. And then your renewal is eight, uh, 90 bucks. So they're saying, you know, it's not, you, you guys can do that. You know, we're trying to make sure you can't afford your groceries, but we're going to make you pay all this stuff. And then like, if it, is it a burden and you're on your time? Really though? That's what they're saying. Is it really a burden? It takes you about an hour to fill out your form for your form seven application. Oh, mem nuts. Good name. Thank you. Was there any mention of selling inherited guns? I haven't seen any mention of it. Uh, nothing yet, but if you sell it to earn a profit, then it automatically triggers. Uh, if you're doing it and making money, unless you're selling the whole thing to, if I remember what we read, to get a better gun. But we'll see. I, I didn't see anything specific to to your inherited guns, so that it would mean that they would consider it as a regular, regular gun. Uh, the Form 4 application is only a half an hour. That's their justification. Uh, time to travel and to obtain the fingerprints maybe take you an hour. Uh, photograph maybe a half an hour. Uh, A and D records maybe maybe five minutes. Uh, fill out a form forty four seventy three maybe five minutes. Qualification inspection time uh, it's fifteen hours is when they the ATF comes and, and inspects your FFL location. And the compliance inspection is about 34 hours. That's, again, them doing the compliance checks. Uh, some states require uh, state inspections by fire and local PD as well. So they're saying, oh, that, that's all. Yeah, that's all we're going to do. And your first year costs to obtain an FFL, 
it's about uh, let's see, two hundred and so about six hundred and seventy five dollars for your first year cost. You know, gas is up fifty percent under Biden, um, but you can afford all this stuff. We're just to make you do this stuff. You want to sell a gun? Uh, recurring cost to become an FFL varies by year, but it's uh, it's about seven hundred eighty two dollars worth of, of time for the inspections and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, what else? Oh, is state by state, state dealer licensing costs uh, flowing from this rule. So if you're in these states, you can see how much it'll cost. Um, don't really understand what it means because I'm not an FFL. So cost determination of leases and all that stuff. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. The bottom line is uh, ATF. Uh, guys, if you uh, wouldn't mind, uh, like the video and share it so people understand that I broke this thing down and read it. Um, not the bullshit uh, stuff where they're saying, and this is all crime trace guns. This is all their stuff. They're just trying to justify their rule. We know it's a lie. Um, this is all their legal jargon saying that, you know what, ATF, uh, we love you and we're trying to save you, America. Um, so, Share this video. I think people need to understand what's going on today and what happened and how it can, can jam them up, even if they trade a gun for snowplow activities or for survival food and stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of gray area. If you get a gun somehow, whether it's inherited or whatever, and I try to sell it at some point, will I get jammed up? The answer is maybe, maybe not. It's as clear as mud, and that's what the ATF wants. Like all of their rules, it's as clear as mud. And they would much rather jam you up and ruin your life with 10 years in prison and a quarter million dollar fine for each infraction than to help you and to leave you alone, rather. So I appreciate y'all. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Remember, America, we do not get our rights from government. ATF is part of government. In fact, they're not even elected. They're bureaucrats. We don't get our rights from them, and they can't take them from us. We get our rights from our creator. We have an inherent right to self-defense. We have a right to defend ourselves, to keep and bear arms. We don't get it from government, guys and gals. You are your own first responder. Carry a gun to keep yourself safe because there's not an ATF agent. There's not a cop. There's not a firefighter. There's not a government uh, agent that will be there when evil shows up and wants to do you harm. They won't be there going to be on you. And the faster you realize that, the faster you'll realize what's really going on in this country. Appreciate y'all from the bottom of my heart. I really do. I'll see you all in the next one. Take it easy.